she's lining the winding road I've got a name I've got a name Hi, this is Ben Hart. I'm going to talk to you today about how to achieve your goals. Now imagine playing a soccer game without goals. Everyone just runs around aimlessly on the soccer field, kicking the soccer ball, but no goals can be scored because no goal nets have been set up and no score is being kept. Now that would be a pretty boring way to play soccer, wouldn't it? But a lot of people go through life this way. They go to school every day or they go to work every day, but they really don't have an end result in mind. They have no plan for their day or for their week. They don't have a picture of what they would like to achieve in life in one year, in three years, in five years, or in ten years. They have no picture in their mind of what success looks like. Studies show that lack of a goal, lack of direction, tends to lead to depression. And that people who have goals tend to be much happier people. People want to be going somewhere. They want to be making progress toward a destination. But if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And most of the time, you're just going to end up driving in circles. You won't make any progress. You won't get anywhere. The first step in achieving your goals in life is to actually set goals and be specific. There's a big difference between a goal and a dream. You might dream of being a major league baseball player, but that's not really a goal, is it? That's more of a dream. Goals are dreams that you actually act on. One goal might be to be the starting shortstop on your high school baseball team next year. After you've achieved that, the next goal might be to play well enough so that you can get a scholarship to play college baseball. And then, once you've achieved that, the next goal might be to play well enough in college baseball so that you are drafted by a major league baseball team. These are all big goals just by themselves that require a step-by-step -step strategy for achieving each of these goals, including a schedule for achieving these goals. Each of these big goals requires you to set and achieve many little goals along the way. You will also need good coaching and daily practice. For a dream to become a goal, you need to take action, daily action, and you need a plan for achieving each goal. Your plan must be a written plan. If your plan is not written down, it's not a plan. Your plan must be step by step. It must have a time frame and a schedule for achieving each step as you march toward your goal. If your plan is not a written plan, if it's not a step-by-step -step plan, and if there's no schedule for achieving each step of your plan, then it's not a plan. If you set goals without a step-by-step -step plan, without specifics, without a schedule, that would be like trying to drive from New York City to New Orleans without a map. You're not going to get there. A big key for me in achieving my goals is to constantly envision success. If you're a gymnast, and your goal is to be able to do a backflip on a balance beam without falling off, you have to envision yourself in your mind doing exactly that. Envision the huge cheer from the crowd that will erupt when you hit your backflip in a competition. This is how you stay motivated because you have a picture in your mind, a constant picture in your mind of exactly what success looks like and what it feels like. Now let me share with you my approach for setting and achieving goals because I think this might help you. I was a senior in college, Dartmouth College, when I wrote my first book titled Poisoned Ivy. But writing a 256 page book appeared to me at the start to be a daunting task. Heck, it was hard enough for me to write a five page term paper, but writing a 256 page book that would actually be considered good enough to be published by a major New York publishing company seemed, well, pretty impossible and unlikely. But I made up my mind to write the book anyway. I figured that even if my book was never actually accepted for publication by a publisher, I would at least get a lot of writing practice. I would at least be a much better writer after writing the 250 pages. Actually, more like 300 manuscript pages. The daily goal I set 
was to write three pages, three pages a day. Psychologically and emotionally, I could not get my mind around writing 300 manuscript pages. I would become too discouraged and would probably quit the project if I thought about writing 300 pages all the time. But instead I thought, if I just commit myself to writing three pages a day, well, that's a doable task. And at the end of a hundred days of doing that, I would have a 300-page manuscript. My commitment was that writing those three pages had to be my first job when waking up in the morning after breakfast. Then I would have to sit at the typewriter for as long as it took to come up with the three written pages. We didn't have computers in those days. I had a manual typewriter. So I could either write the three pages or I would have to stare at the blank page for eight hours. That was the commitment and pledge I made to myself. Write the three pages a day or stare at the blank page all day long. So the three pages got written every day. I actually ended up writing about 600 pages of manuscript because a lot of what I wrote really wasn't that good. I also wrote a plan for the book that included chapter titles and an outline for each chapter. Those chapter titles and outline for each chapter provided the roadmap for writing the book. The chapter titles and outlines, of course, changed along the way. Plans always change as you go. The important thing is to have a written plan and a schedule because that's how you chart, track, and measure your progress. If you can't chart, track, and measure your progress toward your goal, you don't have a goal. You just have a dream. So set a big goal. Then set many mini goals, daily achievable goals, that will ultimately lead you to achieving your big goal. My big goal was to write this book, to have it published by a major publisher. But to achieve that goal, I had to write a chapter outline for the book, and an outline for each chapter, and then commit to writing three pages a day. The result was, I achieved my goal. Poisoned Ivy was written, and it was published by a major New York publisher, Stein and Day, and it actually ended up being a national bestseller. The side benefit was, I became a much better writer by writing every day. So even if I had not succeeded in actually seeing the book published, it still would have been a very worthwhile project because I'm convinced that the ability to write well is one of the most valuable skills you can learn in life. And I went on to become a professional writer. I've now written seven books. I've written speeches for some of America's leading political figures, including Presidents Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. And I make a very good living as one of America's top writers of advertisements. So there were many benefits that flowed from making that commitment to write a book during my senior year at Dartmouth College. That project really set the direction for much of my life. I also adopted that method of setting and achieving goals in every area of my life. For example, I set a goal of reading the entire Bible in one year. The Bible is a big book. It's about 1,500 pages long, depending on what edition you're reading. If I were to just sit down and start reading the Bible from page one, this would seem like a daunting task. I'd probably quit. But if I make a commitment to read four pages a day, I can get through the entire Bible in one year. Or take my professional life and career. I make a living today as a writer, specifically as an advertising copywriter. I write advertisements. I get paid for writing. If I don't write, I don't get paid. I have found that if I don't start writing as the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning, I'll never get started writing that day. Other things will start to interfere with my writing. Phone calls will come in from clients or I'll start wasting time by poking around on the internet. Also, when I wake up in the morning, that's when my mind is at its most fresh and, sh and sharp. Morning is when my brain is working best. So I use that peak brain time, the morning hours, to get my most important writing done. I don't take any phone calls during that period. I don't check my email. I don't log onto the internet. I don't do anything that will distract me from completing my writing project. Writing is my focus time. For me, writing is very much like Tiger Woods standing over a putt. That's his focus time. He gets paid by sinking putts. I get paid by writing.
So what I do before I go to bed the night before is I write down what I must achieve the next day. First and foremost being the writing project I must complete or some portion of the writing project I must complete. Then the first thing I do when I wake up is brush my teeth, pour myself a cup of coffee, grab a bite to eat, and then I start writing. I write from 7 a.m. to noon. I find that I really can't write for more than about five hours a day. Not write and produce good material. After about five hours, my brain basically turns to mush. Also, I find I write best in 45-minute bursts. Then I have to take a 15-minute break. Then I write for another 45 minutes. I'm very strict about the 45 minutes. I set a timer and a bell that goes off after 45 minutes of writing. I will then do some exercise, some push-ups, crunches, lunges, other forms of calisthenics, and I'll do that for 10 minutes. Then I'll get something to eat, usually a banana or some berries. This is how I achieve both my professional as well as my health and fitness goals at the same time. Then I'll start writing again for 45 minutes. And I'll do this until noon each day. So I don't really write for five hours straight each day. My writing day is five 45 minute periods broken up by 15 minute periods of exercise and attending to the physical needs of life, eating, going to the restroom, etc. And just resting. This is how I pace myself. Life is a marathon. The prize goes not to the sprinter, but to the steady and the consistent. If I try to write eight hours a day, that won't work, not over the long run. I'll burn myself out. And I'll actually end up writing less in the long run. Same with training for a sport. You can't train every day. You certainly can't train the same muscles every day. Your body needs rests. It needs time to recharge and replenish its batteries. You need time to recover. So that's my routine from 7 a.m. until noon each day. I spend that time writing. After that, my brain is basically mush. Writing is very mentally draining. I'll then have lunch for 30 minutes or so while reading the news of the day. And then I'll attend to professional duties that don't require the same level of brain power as writing. I'll have conference call meetings with clients or I'll put together a marketing plan or perhaps I'll do some design work on a website I'm building or perhaps I'll clean up my office. But whatever I'm doing during my afternoon period, I also have that written down and scheduled out the night before. I find that if I don't write down the night before exactly what I have to do and achieve the next day, I won't get anything done. If I wake up in the morning and don't know exactly what I must do, the minute I get up, nothing much is going to happen. I'll find ways to get distracted. Write down your schedule the night before. And it shouldn't just be a to-do list. Allocate the exact amount of time you will spend on each project or task. And every project and task you perform must be a step toward achieving your goal. That's how you get things done. That's how you make steady progress toward your goal. Never wake up in the morning wondering, what will I do today? What will I do now? Know exactly what you'll be doing every minute of your day. And by the way, your schedule should include recreation, playtime. It can include watching an hour of TV or playing a video game. Nothing wrong with that. Everyone needs downtime. Your brain needs a rest. But don't let one hour of TV turn into three hours of TV or five hours of TV. You won't achieve much in life by lying on the couch for five hours a day watching TV. The average American spends five hours a day watching TV. One in four Americans spend more time on the Internet than they do sleeping. You can't achieve anything this way. Schedule your TV and internet time. Five minutes a day at most on Facebook. The main thing is to set goals and to write them down. Then take concrete specific steps each day to achieve your goals. The only way this can happen is if you have a written schedule and routine that you go through each day. For example, here's Tiger Woods daily schedule and routine for achieving what he wants to achieve in golf. This is Tiger's schedule for practice. At 6 o'clock he wakes up and he, ha he works out from 6 to 7.30 a.m. From 7.30 to 9 a.m. he has a shower and breakfast. From 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. he hits balls on the practice range. From 11 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. he practices his putting. From 11.30 to 12.30 p.m. he plays nine holes of golf. At 12.30 to 1 o'clock he has lunch. From 1 to 3 p.m., 
He hits balls on the practice range. From 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock p.m., he works on his short game. From 4 to 5 p.m., he plays another nine holes of golf. From 5 to 5.30 p.m., he hits balls again on the practice range. From 5.30 to 6 p.m., he practices his putting. And then he showers, has dinner, and his evenings are for reading, watching TV, and are just downtime. So that's a 12-hour day. A 12-hour day dedicated to becoming great at golf. This schedule, by the way, is not especially unique to Tiger. Just about all the top golfers on the PGA Tour have a similar schedule. Anyone who wants to be world-class at anything, a world-class athlete, a world-class artist, a world-class pianist, world-class at anything, has a schedule that looks a lot like this. That's what it takes to be great at something. If you want to be a great artist, you have to paint a lot. You need to paint every day. You need to study how to paint. You need to study the secret to the great artists. You need to have great art teachers and role models, instructors. And when you set a goal that includes a written plan and a schedule for achieving your goal, it's important not to lose momentum by skipping days. It's fine to take days off, it's fine to take breaks, but they should be scheduled breaks, scheduled days off. Otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to lose momentum. You never want to lose momentum. I'm a big believer in completing every project I start, and I'll set a schedule for each project. I also believe that to be great at something, you need to love what you're doing. It's impossible to be great at something that you hate doing. This is why I always encourage kids to find their passion and to pursue it. Now you want to find a passion that you can conceivably someday make a living at. So if your passion is, say, collecting old socks, you'll probably want to go to plan B. That is, find something else that you like to do. I'm a big believer that every kid should find a hobby or a sport that they love to do, or perhaps become a great artist or musician. My passion growing up was ski racing. I wanted to be the best ski racer in the world. Now, I fell short of that goal, but I did get very good at ski racing. I was one of the top junior ski racers in the country. I could have made a very good living at skiing if I wanted to, but I decided to be a writer instead. A good friend of mine's passion is martial arts and fitness. He's making a very good living with his martial arts and fitness school. My son's passion is politics and film. You can certainly make a very good living in those fields if you really pursue them. Here's what's great about pursuing your passion. If you are passionate about something, if you want to become great at a sport or a hobby or an art or music or some field of study, there are millions and millions of people out there who are passionate about the same thing, who share your passion. This means there are millions and millions of people out there who are looking for instruction on this sport or this hobby or art or music or field of study, and there are millions of people who buy products that relate to their sport or hobby, their passion. This means that even if you don't succeed in achieving your goal of being the best in the world at your sport or your hobby, there will be a huge market out there for teachers and coaches in your sport, hobby, or field. Let's say your passion is to be the greatest golfer in the world. And let's say you make a decision to undertake a daily regimen similar to the Tiger Woods program that I described to you earlier. Well, chances are you won't actually achieve your ultimate goal of becoming the greatest golfer in the world because there are lots of others out there who have made a similar commitment to spend thousands of hours practicing golf, playing golf, competing in tournaments, getting great coaching, etc. But if you were to actually make this commitment to try to become the greatest golfer in the world, and you were serious about that commitment, and you really undertook all the steps that would be required to become the greatest golfer in the world, including putting in about 10,000 hours of practice, you would certainly become an excellent golfer. And you would certainly become good enough that you could teach others how to play golf. Millions of people actually earn their living in the golf industry. The golf industry is a very big industry. In America alone, golf is a $68 billion industry with 2 million jobs. So you could certainly make a living in golf. Or perhaps your passion is music. That was David Geffen's passion, even though he wasn't a musician. But he was very good at identifying musical talent. So he became a billionaire doing that, finding great musical artists, recording them and marketing them. He found and promoted such artists and groups as Bob Dylan, 
Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, The Eagles, Jackson Brown, Linda Ronstadt, and many others. Music is a $168 billion industry. If your passion is music, you can certainly find a place in the music industry and make a very good living at it there if you have anything on the ball at all, even if you are not good or lucky enough to become a famous pop star. But here's my point. If you love what you are doing, work will never seem like work. I often say that if you love what you are doing, you will never work a day in your life. And you are so much more likely to become very good at what you love to do. This is why it's so important to have a sport or a hobby or an art that you passionately pursue. Let's say your hobby is stamp collecting. Could you make a good living at this? Well, there are more than 4 million self-identified stamp collectors in America. Of those, 130,000 people subscribe to some sort of stamp collecting publication. Sales of rare stamps total about one billion a year. It's not a huge industry, nothing like music or golf, but, but you can make a good living in the stamp collecting industry if that was your passion. I'm a big fan of making a living at your hobby. That is finding a way to make a living at doing what you love. You'll get good at what you love doing. You'll become an expert at it. My passion growing up was ski racing. But I was also very interested in politics. I also became very interested in writing and in the field of marketing. I've made millions of dollars over the years writing political advertisements and marketing political candidates and causes. That's a big part of what I do. And I never feel like I'm working because I'm always doing what I love doing. As a result, I'm very good at what I do. What you really don't want to have happen is, is to be stuck in a job that you hate because you have to make a living. Don't let that happen to you. Find your passion. Pursue it passionately. Become an expert at it. And adopt the Tiger Woods mindset. Schedule an approach to trying to become among the best in the world at your hobby. And then find a way to make a living at it. If you really are among the best in the world at something, you can find a way to make a good living at almost anything. And you'll be a whole lot happier in life if you are making a living at something that you love doing. Now, while you are pursuing your passion, you also, of course, need to make sure that you're doing well at school. In fact, make doing well at school your passion. I found that a great way to motivate myself to do well in school, even though my primary passion was ski racing, was to treat school like a game. A game that I try to win. A game that I try to be the best in my class at. You have to be in school anyway, so why waste the time? Why not spend your time trying to win this game called school? Now, to become good at anything, you also need coaches and teachers. It's almost impossible to be good at anything without a teacher. Your teacher or your coach is your shortcut to success. Most professional golfers, most professional athletes have more than one coach. Professional golfers have a swing coach, a short game coach, a putting coach, a fitness coach. Some have psychologists to make sure that, that they have the right mindset. Very few world-class athletes, musicians, artists, software engineers, doctors, lawyers, writers, very few world-class anything become world-class without teachers, coaches, mentors, and role models. You can't make it on your own. You can't make it by constantly trying to reinvent the wheel by yourself. Learn from others who have already been down this road. Always seek out expert help. Always seek out instructors who know what it takes to succeed in your sport, your hobby, or your field. You also need to track and measure your progress. Whatever you are constantly tracking and measuring always gets better. Whatever you are measuring and reporting publicly improves exponentially. Conversely, whatever you don't track and measure always gets worse. If you are chubby and you don't weigh yourself regularly, you're going to just get fatter. If you are chubby and want to lose weight, just start weighing yourself every day. Almost certainly, you will find ways to lose the weight. And then if you post the results publicly for your friends to see, you'll find a way to lose the weight faster. That's just how the human mind works. If your big goal is to lose 20 pounds, set a goal of losing one pound a week. That's a realistic goal. That will require burning 500 more calories per day than you consume in food. This can be done by eating less, exercising more, or some combination of the two. All this can be measured and tracked. 
If you don't measure and track your weight, it's very unlikely that you're going to achieve your goal of losing 20 pounds in 20 weeks. Now, there is something else that is very important that happens to you when you achieve a goal. You actually become a different person. Let's say you set a goal to lose 20 pounds in 20 weeks, and let's say you achieve that goal through a combination of changing your eating habits combined with an exercise program. You now know, after you've achieved this goal, what it takes to lose this weight and to keep the weight off. You will always have that knowledge and that feeling that you can do it. You have literally become a different person. Or let's take me with my business. In my early 30s, I was able to build a highly profitable advertising agency. I became a millionaire. I made a few dumb decisions and lost my business and just about all of my money. I literally went broke. Did I panic? Well, maybe I did a little. But then I just went back to work and rebuilt my business and became even financially stronger than I was before. I knew exactly what to do because I had built a business before. I just had to do it again. As a result, I never worry about going broke anymore because I know that if I make a dumb decision again, hopefully I won't, and I go broke, I'll be able to rebuild again. It's no big deal. But when I was an employee working for somebody else, I used to worry all the time about getting fired and losing my only source of income. I used to wonder what would happen to me if I ever lost my job. So I'm a different person now than I was when I was an employee, before I built my first business. Now that I've built several successful businesses, and now that I know that I can do this repeatedly, I never worry about going broke anymore. So I'm literally a different person than I was when I was an employee in my 20s working for somebody else because of the knowledge I have gained by building several successful businesses. It's much like learning how to ride a bicycle. Learning how to ride a bicycle is scary and difficult. If you've never ridden a bicycle before, you're likely to crash a few times. But once you learn the trick of how to ride a bicycle, you never forget how. You have literally become a different person. This happens every time you set a goal and achieve it. You undergo a transformation in your identity. Not only have you gained knowledge that you didn't have before, but you've also gained confidence. Achievement tends to lead to more goal setting and more achievement. Success tends to lead to more success. And this process leads to your transformation really into a new person. As you achieve your goals and gain the confidence and knowledge that comes with striving for and achieving your goal. As you gain confidence, you will then start setting higher goals and bigger challenges for yourself. And as you set and achieve your goals, people will probably notice that you are a happier person with a smile, with more of a bounce in your step. You are literally becoming a different person the more you set goals and achieve them. And this process of personal transformation can actually happen on a near daily or weekly basis because remember, you might have this one big goal out there, but you will also be setting mini goals along the way, benchmarks, targets that ultimately lead to your big goal. So let's say your big goal is to be able to do 100 push-ups in a row without stopping. And let's say you can only do 10 push-ups right now. Your mini goal then might be to increase the number of push-ups you can do by three per week. So if next week you are able to do 13 push-ups instead of 10, then the week after that 16 push-ups, and then the week after that you can do 19 push-ups, you are making progress toward your goal and you start feeling better about yourself. You start to gain confidence. You become a happier person. You are literally becoming a different person. You are undergoing a transformation in your identity. This is why setting goals is so important and mapping out a written program and schedule for achieving your goals is so essential to your happiness in life. Idle people tend to be unhappy, depressed people. An idle mind really is the devil's playground. People are just happier when they feel they are working hard and making progress toward a goal, toward some destination. People are happier when they know where they are heading. There are so many great side effects also of setting goals and mapping out a plan and schedule for achieving them, even if you don't always ultimately achieve your goal. When I was a teenager, my goal was to become the best ski racer in the world. I, I figure I put in something like 10,000 hours of practice and training 
trying to achieve that goal when I was a kid and when I was a teenager. I failed. I didn't achieve that goal, but I did become a good ski racer, one of the top juniors in the country. I also learned a lot just by trying to achieve the goal. I learned how to work hard. I learned self-discipline. I learned what it takes to be a world-class athlete, world-class in anything. And I was able to apply what I learned to other goals that I would later set. And probably the most important thing I developed was a strong work ethic. I believe that having a strong work ethic is the single most important character trait to achieving success in life. You can't achieve anything important if you're not willing to work and work very hard at it. I learned my work ethic trying to become a world-class ski racer. And I apply this approach to every goal I set. When I set out to write and publish my first book, Poisoned Ivy, I did not know if I would succeed in finding a publisher for it, but I wanted to be a writer. I knew I wanted to write for a living. I figured if I want to be a writer, I'd better write. I'd better write a lot. I'd better write every day. The best way for me to make sure that happened was to set this goal of writing this book and to set a schedule for that, a daily regimen, a daily routine. I basically applied the work ethic and discipline I learned trying to pursue my ski racing goal to pursuing my goal of becoming a successful writer and to my goal of building a business and a second business and a third business. This is how you become a new person just by setting and pursuing goals. Even if you don't succeed in achieving your ultimate goal, you will still develop all kinds of skills just by trying to achieve your goal. Skills that will serve you in any field that you pursue. Skills that will serve you well throughout your entire life. Most importantly, you will develop habits and a work ethic that can be applied to all of your other goals that you set in life. You will develop character, confidence, and a competitive spirit. Instead of avoiding challenges, you will seek them out. You will certainly fail often, but you will never fear failure. In fact, if you're not failing, you haven't set a high enough goal. Failure after failure after failure ultimately leads to success. Trying and failing is how you learn. Failing over and over again until you finally get it. There's no failure for those who try. The success is in the trying. Is Joe Frazier, the great fighter, a failure because he lost two of his three fights to Muhammad Ali? No, of course not. No one sees Joe Frazier as a failure. Those three fights will go down as three of the greatest fights of all time. Brutal fights, and Joe Frazier is regarded as one of the greatest fighters to ever step into a boxing ring because of those three epic fights, even though he lost two of his three fights to the great Muhammad Ali. had made a strong comeback. There he goes down on his back. As President Teddy Roosevelt once put it so well, the credit belongs to the person who actually is in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those timid spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. The shame is not in trying and failing. The shame is in not trying. Okay, let's review the 12 key points on how to achieve your goals in life. 1. To achieve a goal, you must set goals. Figure out what your goals are. 
A goal is different than a dream. A goal is a dream that you act on. Two, set daily goals that lead to your big goal. Do something every day that leads to your goal. Three, have a written plan and a written schedule that includes benchmarks, daily targets that you try to hit. If your plan is not a written plan, if it's just in your head, it's really not a plan. Number four, know before you go to bed every night exactly what you intend to accomplish the next day. Number five, develop a strong work ethic. You can't achieve anything if you're not willing to work hard. Six, find your passion. It won't seem like work if you're doing what you love doing. Number seven, never fear failure. If you aren't failing, you aren't pushing yourself hard enough. Your goal is too modest. Have big goals. Make no small plans. Eight, measure and track your progress. Whatever you measure and track always gets better. Whatever you're not measuring and tracking always gets worse. Nine, pace yourself. Life is a marathon. The prize doesn't go to the sprinter, it goes to the steady and the consistent. 10. Don't waste your time. Schedule your TV and internet time. Spend no more than one hour a day on TV and on internet entertainment. Using the internet for research and to help you complete real tasks relevant to your goal is fine, but don't waste time on the internet. Get coaching. Your coaches and teachers are your shortcut to success. They've been there. They know what it takes to succeed. Listen to them. Do what they say. Follow their advice. 12. Envision success. Have a picture in your mind of what success looks like. If you want to hit a great golf shot, envision yourself hitting the great golf shot. Even better, envision yourself hitting the clutch golf shot to win the Masters. That's how you stay motivated to succeed and to achieve your goal. And remember, set big goals. Make no small plans. If you adopt this attitude, this mindset, this approach, I promise that you will have a much happier, more fulfilling life. Like the pine trees lining the winding road, I've got a name. I've got a name.